learning, you know? Yes? So, so I'm detecting a little bit of a straw man here because if your so-called evolutionist view isn't half as solid as you're making it out to be, there's a big argument now whether or not dinosaurs were warm or cold-blooded, and there's no bird fossils at all. There's only three Archaeopteryx fossils in the whole world. Nothing else even looks like a bird. They're real willing to talk about what's the problem with it. I don't see this monolithic view held by the evolutionists at all. I mean, I just got done going through six books on early man for a paper on the Piltdown hoax, and these guys can't agree on a whole habilis at all. There's no view out there that's saying, yes, it's this way, yes, they did this. They're real flexible on that. I think it's kind of who you talk to, but I sure don't detect this evolutionist monolith out there that okay. has to be, a, you know, that they're all got this view because they know. One way or the other. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a good point. But see, what I'm concerned about, I guess, as a high school teacher, is what is in our grade school and junior high and high school textbooks. I assure you, in those books, it is a monolithic worldview. This is the way it happened, boys and girls. It is presented as if it is a fact. There is no other alternatives offered. So at a college level, you may have a good point. But at junior high, high school level, it is, it is a monolithic worldview. This is the way it happened. And so I object to that. I think the teaching of evolution is largely religious, not scientific. Now, we must define our terms. Evolution. I have Webster's Dictionary's definition of evolution. Okay? Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, second college edition, 1986. Evolution, I'm just going to read part of it here, and I'll, you're welcome to look it up for yourself. A development of a species, organism, or organ from its original or primitive state to its present or specialized state, phylogeny or ontogeny. The theory now generally accepted that all species of plants and animals develop from earlier forms of hereditary transmission of slight variations of successive generations. Well, actually, what this, this is, I think, a little deceitful because what is taught in our textbooks is more than just the idea that parents may have children that are different than the parents a little bit. That would be classified, in my view, as microevolution. There is evolution in that sense as far as variations. You know, I have three children, they're all very different. If a couple has ten children, they're all going to be very different. And your grandkids will be even more different. But that's not really evolution. That's where we need to define the term, I guess, and I should have done this earlier, micro and macro. I would accept microevolution. I would say, for instance, you could get a variety of mutts from the dog pound, and over the next 50 years, through selective breeding, you could develop a wide variety of dogs. You could maybe even develop the Chihuahua and the Great Dane in 100 years. I don't know, maybe take 500 years, but it could be done. But stand 50 feet away and look at it. It is still a dog. It is obviously not a hamster or a turtle or a tomato. It is not really evolution in the sense that's taught in our textbooks. What's taught in the textbooks is that these examples of microevolution are somehow proof of the general theory of macroevolution. And that's where I disagree. This is a religion. There is no evidence whatsoever to back this up. Nobody has ever seen a fish turn into an amphibian or an amphibian to a reptile, or a reptile to a mammal. Nobody's ever observed that. Nobody's ever found a fossil. That is a belief. The fact that we have micro changes, I'll put that in the fact column. Micro variations. You can ask anybody that raises anything for a living. Find some fellow who raises tomatoes for a living and tries to develop hybrids or purebreds. He will tell you, oh yeah, you can get a wide variety. You may get 50 different kinds of tomatoes. But there are limits. And when the further you get from the norm, you may get one desirable trait, but you're going to get some real serious defects. Any cattle breeder will tell you, he can get a cow that'll give a lot more milk, but it's not as disease hardy. You know, it succumbs to diseases easily or some, some other thing else goes wrong. So that would fit perfectly with the creationist worldview that God them after their kind, not species. Each kind of animal was originally created and there has been variation and diversification within that kind, but nothing changing to a new kind of animal. For instance, uh, dogs. All the different dogs, including the wolf and the coyote and the hyena and the fox, may have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue that. But it's still in the dog family. It's still the same kind of animal. You didn't get a new kind of animal out of it. And, the further, and you may diversify to the point where they are no longer interfertile. Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Though technically they are interfertile, except for mechanical reasons, they are they could produce they could produce a puppy, but um, they they are now a, classified maybe as a new species. But it's still the same kind of animal. 
The word species is really where the problem arose back in the 1800s. Darwin could easily see that you could raise pigeons, and he was a great raiser of pigeons. He could easily see that it doesn't take long to develop all kinds of varieties of pigeons. But you're never going to get a crow. And you certainly aren't going to get a mammal or a reptile or a fish out of that pigeon. So all he ever pointed out, and all that has ever been pointed out, is micro changes, which are perfectly compatible with the creationist worldview. There has never been pointed out a macro change. And because of that very thing, there are many now who are going to the punctuated equilibrium theory, like Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, who are saying, well, we, we don't see any evidence for evolution, therefore it must have happened rapidly. So you're arguing from a lack of evidence as proof for your theory? Come on, you better try that one on one more time. That's not going to get past me anyway. Lack of evidence proves it happened? <laughs> no, no, no. That, to me, that's an indication, hey, maybe the Bible's been right all along. Maybe the only evolution has been micro variation, which really would be a proof of an intelligent creator. If I was going to produce some animals to live in a world that had a variety of climates, I would give that animal an incredible <coughs> DNA code so that that animal could produce a variety of babies and some could survive in any given environment within limits. The rabbit can produce long-haired babies and short-haired babies and thick fur and short fur, thin fur. Some can survive the hot climates, some can survive the cold climates. And over the last 4,400 years, they have diversified until today, the Alaska rabbits will not interbreed with the Florida rabbits. They cannot. Their breeding cycle is totally different. Now, the Alaska rabbits can breed with the Minnesota rabbits. They're not too far different yet. And the Minnesota rabbits can breed with Florida rabbits, but the two extremes can no longer interbreed. That's not evolution. That simple variation is still the same kind of animal. That's a micro change. It's still a rabbit, you know. Stand back and look at it. It is obviously not a turtle. So that's my objection, is that the theory of macroevolution is included in with the textbooks for our junior high and high school kids as if it is a fact, and it is a far cry from a fact. It's a religion. You can take, like the branches on a tree. You have the different 250 varieties of dogs probably had a common ancestor and the ancestor was a dog, right? All the different varieties of cats, you know, Siamese and all those different kinds of cats probably had a common ancestor that was a cat of some kind. From here up, this would be micro changes. This would be observable. Nobody's gonna argue with that. From here down, that the dog and the cat had a common ancestor somewhere way back when, that it would be macro changes, and that would be part of a faith, a belief, a religion, not observable. No, that's not true. Uh, okay. We don't uh, call macro evolution a, a religion. It is a scientific theory. It's not, it's not a religion. It's a scientific theory. Okay. Let me read you a definition of religion. Webster's Second Collegiate Dictionary. Religion, a belief in a divine or superhuman power or powers to be obeyed and worshipped as the creator and ruler of the universe. How did the universe get here? Did this, did this process called evolution bring everything into being that we see today? Is that, was it, is that what created the universe, this process? Well then that's your God. It is indeed a religion. How did the world get here? Those are your words. Um, from a scientific standpoint, we would call our interpretation of macroevolution a scientific theory. Okay. But not a religion. I think science and religion ought to be separate, but they are certainly not in our textbooks. To teach kids that the Big Bang is a fact, for instance, and it is taught as a fact in the textbooks. I collect the books. It is taught as a fact. That is wrong. The Big Bang is a far cry from a fact. It's just taught as a theory. Not in the books it's not. I collect them. It may be in college level. You may be getting it. There's several different options, but you should see what's in the junior high book. Boys and girls, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth cooled down from a hot molten mass. But that's not a fact. I mean, were you there? You know, do you know anybody who was? But I'm t I assure you, it is taught as a fact to our younger kids, and I strongly object to that. Yes, sir. I'm curious about your geological data. Okay. For one thing, um, you talk about the Grand Canyon having originally been a soft sedimentary mass, well, and then forming into, you know, through I guess fluvial processes, forming into the canyon that it is today. Mm -hmm. Well, under those circumstances, of course all of the sediment around it would also be have washed at the same level 
down to the ocean below instead of forming rivulets, it would have all formed at the same time. Also, the ocean going from the middle of the continent down towards the ocean basin would cause shell deposits to be found in the middle of like the, the Great Plains right now. And they are. Well, not really. I found 500 shark's teeth in South Dakota in 30 minutes. I got them at home. But why do we have 100 Grand Canyons all around the world, you know, where these, these soft sedimentary processes were going on? Sure. As the, the biblical interpretation would be, during the course of this flood, which lasted just about a year, a little over a year, 12 months, according to the dates given in the Bible, the flood lasted 12 months. The first four or five months were probably with slowly rising waters from a variety of tectonic things, and then the last few months with it going down. But it wasn't just rain 40 days, everybody drowned, get off the boat and go home. It was not that way at all. It was a year-long flood. During that year-long flood, the earth covered by water would develop many thousands of layers of sediments. It is a fact. The earth has layers. Okay? No question. Now, how do you interpret that? The evolutionist interpretation is each of these layers came at either a different season or a different year or a different era or epoch. And they have names for all of them, the geologic column, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, and they got the Jurassic and Triassic and Permian, Cambrian, I'm familiar with all of that. You might be interested to know the only place in the world where you can find all 12 layers in order, the only place it occurs is in the textbook. The geologic column doesn't exist any place in the world in its entirety. If it did, it would be many, many miles thick. It simply isn't, it doesn't exist. It has been put together piece by piece and a little bit of imagination thrown in for glue. Charles Lyell is really the fellow who developed the geologic column. Many others got involved in this, Hutton, Cuvier, Steno, you know, I'm familiar with all that. But Lyell would be the primary culprit in this. The geologic column doesn't exist any place. The fact is, I would, I would say the creationist interpretation is that the flood caused all these layers, or nearly all of those layers, to be deposited very rapidly. Just the earth turning under the moon, causing the tides, with no continents to stop them, the tides would become harmonic. The tides may be 200 feet in a worldwide flood. The rising and lowering of the tide waters would reshuffle all the sediments. You can get a jar of dirt out of the yard here. Well, Florida doesn't have dirt. You've got to go north to get dirt. They've got sand here. But get a jar of dirt, put water in it, and shake it up. It'll settle out into layers for you automatically. It's called hydrologic sorting. Denser particles go to the bottom. Uh, when Mount St. Helens blew its top in 1980, it blew 150 feet of sediment down into the Toodle River Valley. My sister lived right near there. I flew down inside the volcano a few years after it happened with my brother-in-law. Flew all over the area. Can Andrew, uh, get the slide projector on there. Uh, you can leave your lights on to videotape, but I'll show them a few... Uh, things that were formed as a result of Grand Canyon. I mean, as a result of Mount St. Helens when it blew its top. Wait, before you get to that, I need to know where, what these sediments arrived. What are they part of if they were laid down a year and they were on mountains yet? What, where, they, where the sediments sell them? Oh, the, the grinding up, the reshuffling, that's where sediments come from. There's no new dirt being added to the earth so to speak of. So the original surface is just being worn? Being reshuffled, yeah. Sediments do that. That's where, like, the coal deposits, uh, strip mines, we find coal. That, to me, was because the trees that were destroyed were rolling around and the bark, you know, rolled off. And most coal was made from bark. And the original earth would have had en enormous layers, enormous forests, much bigger than today. Under double atmospheric pressure, plants, trees were huge. Of course, they only lived 1,600 years till the flood took place, so they weren't like the 3,000-year-old sequoias. They didn't have 3,000 years to grow. Do you have an estimate of the uh, depth of water that was added by the flood? I wouldn't, but I know if the oceans weren't as deep and the mountains weren't as high, there's plenty of water now to cover it two miles deep. The Bible says the tallest mountain was covered by 15 cubits, which is about 30, 25, 30 feet. That's how high the tallest mountain was covered. And then as the oceans sank down and the mountains arose, if the mountains rose up slowly, the water would run off slowly, leaving behind nice smooth mountains and big flat plains like Kansas and Nebraska. If the mountains rose up rapidly, like the Rockies, the water would run off faster, carving out features like canyons and you know, Columbia River Valley, uh, carving them out much faster. Why would the mountains rise up now? Well, the Earth is a thin crust. Everybody agrees with that. I mean, why do earthquakes happen now? You know, the plates are moving. The crust is not stable. Plate oh, yeah, yeah, there's plate tectonics. But it hasn't been... You incorporate that in scientific condition? Oh, absolutely. There, I live right by the San Andreas Fault in California. There is no question. It's moving, right? Ask the folks that live there. You can... You know, after an earthquake, and your house falls down. Um, 
I wish you, let me try focusing this just a little bit here. When Mount St. Helens blew all this mud down into the valley, it made so much sediment, and the sediment automatically stratified. This layer of stratified rock, you can see the layers in that, was formed in one day, 25 feet thick. The next time the volcano blew, a hot, scalding hot mudslide cut across that sediment, wiped it out, cut it off sheer cliff, standing straight up. Five days later, it was hard enough to hold a sheer cliff. I mean, this stuff happens, okay? Mount St. Helens did that. All these fine laminations were formed very rapidly. Here the, the, the blast was going, hurricane velocity winds, racing across there from the blast of the volcano, and it formed all these layers rapidly. Snow does the same thing in a snowstorm. As the snow goes moving horizontally in a bad wind, you cut into the snowbank and look at it. It'll be stratified. The heavier flakes at the bottom in the sand, it'll automatically sort the particles for you. So the creationist interpretation is that all of that so-called geologic column took place rapidly. Right now, today, you can go see Mount St. Helens, and there are several canyons that have been formed there um, by Mount St. Helens. The canyons have sheer cliffs, 150 feet high, standing straight up, and they're all stratified, and they were all formed over the last couple of years. The mudslides went through some of the old lava flows that were solid, solid rock. That scalding hot mud went through there and carved canyons 100 feet deep through solid rock in 10 minutes. Because boiling hot mud is very abrasive. During the worldwide flood, the water would have been would have had mud in many areas, you know, and muddy water is much more abrasive than regular water. But it would have to be boiling hot to cut through it. I mean, you're talking about cutting through solid rock. You're not cutting through mud, you know. I'm saying it can be done either way. The Grand Canyon is a mile thick in some places, oh, and it's solid rock. I mean, a mud flow is not going to do that in 10 minutes like you are talking about. The top of Grand Canyon is higher than where the river starts. Rivers only flow downhill. The river flows through the bottom of the canyon. One mile up is the top of the canyon. The top of the canyon is higher than the source of the river. So one of two things has to be true. Either the river flowed uphill for millions of years to cut the groove deep enough, or the mountain slowly rose, Kaibab uplift, at the same rate as the river cut down. I think we've got, we're calling on the supernatural here to assume that the rate kept pace. I think so. The, uh, the okay. source of water for the uh, Grand Canyon is the Rocky Mountains. So you have a considerable height to work with there uh, before you get down to the present day surface. So no matter what the original surface was, you still had that height and a snow belt in order to keep your initial river. If you would look at the drainage pattern of the Grand Canyon, <coughs> all the area drained by it, the source of the rivers that go through that canyon are lower than the top of Kayabab Uplift. How much? I don't know how much lower. Uh, several hundred feet. The top of the canyon is 5,000, I think 400 feet above the bottom of the canyon. Today, the erosion rate through Grand Canyon is very slow. No question. But today, we just have one little river flowing through there. At the bottom of Mount St. Helens, the canyons that are down there from the trees that were blown over, the log jams were every place. Um, get through some of this here. The rivers that were cut, the uh, features that were cut from the I guess it's on the previous slide carousel. I'll get the lights back on and shut that off, would you, bud? Um, the canyons that were cut because of Mount St. Helens exhibit all the features of Grand Canyon. The mud flows stratified everything very rapidly, hundreds of feet thick, and the canyons that were carved out uh, looked just like miniature Grand Canyons, and scientists watched them happen in 15 minutes. You know, so I think that's a mini example of what happened on a macro scale during the year-long flood. Well, they've got a Grand Canyon on Mars that makes the one on Earth look like nothing. So is that assuming that there was a population on Mars that was smitten by a great flood at some point in time? And oh, no, that would have anything to do with that, I don't think. Uh, canyons form the same way, you know, in each case, so... Well, no, no, I didn't say canyons form the same way in each case. I'm saying Mount St. Helens showed us that's how it could have happened. Okay. I think uh, outer space is full of ice. Nobody questions that. There are ice meteors flying around, super cold snowballs. If an ice meteor collided with Mars, Mars gets hot enough to melt the ice, and it would run and flow and could form canyon features. With human habitation would have nothing to do with the canyon on Mars. Okay? Same with the moon. The craters on the moon, you know, they may be from ice impacts because they find almost no meteorites, but lots of craters. You know, an ice, ice impact would do that. It's the very same thing. 
and outer space is full of comets. Of course, I didn't see it happen, and you know, I can't prove it, but that's... When was your grandfather born? When was my grandfather born? Yeah. I never you weren't there and you didn't see it, so... I didn't see it. You know, you're always telling us you didn't see it, you weren't there, but you weren't there for your grandfather's birth either, so how do you know he was born? <laughs> right. That's a good point. That's that a good point. I mean, if we're getting into this, I wasn't there, I didn't see it. Sure. Heck, I'm not looking at what's going on in Chicago right now, but, you know, something's going something's on. Something's going on. Sure. You know? <laughs> That's where you have to keep that thought in mind. What we teach our students needs to be fair and honest, and we're not doing that. We're only presenting them one view. You read the textbooks, yeah, that author's talking like he was there. 4.6 billion years ago, this happened. 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang took place. Yeah, right. You know, you saw that? Yes, so but I object to the dogmatic teaching of evolution in our, in our junior high and high school textbooks. Well, is it healthy to do the same kind of dogmatic teaching that schools such as PCC do, using the Bible as their textbook for such classes as chemistry classes or physics classes? You know, I mean, that's just as one-sided, and these theories are just as tenuous as the kind of evolutionist model that you might come up with. The point would be, like PCC and Christian schools, they teach plenty of evolution. My kids go there. I have their t I paid for the books, okay? I believe me, I've read them all. I've caught from those, taught from those same books. The theory of evolution is thoroughly presented. I would say the kids would come out of PCC with a better understanding of evolution than the kids coming out of Pine Forest. Of course, they're not going to believe it, but they're shown how it's they're shown the theories, and they're shown the fallacies of the theories. They're being educated, not indoctrinated. I would say is the big difference. Take, get all the kids together, give them a test. Give, give all the kids in America a standard science test. The kids going to a Christian school, which is about one-fourth of the cost, will test higher overall. You'll get a few duds in every group, you know, but the general overall average, the kids will test higher in every subject from private schools. Yes, sir? You can't so much blame that on the office of the, of the books or the scientists going to theories as you can the politics of what the public schools filter into what is taught. I mean, private schools have, have greater funds and have uh, more resources to call from, you know, so you... Wait a minute, private schools have greater funds? Not, well, not greater funds, but uh, more support from... Uh, from the parents. Specialized, right? Specialized groups. I mean, so. average kid, I think, I don't know what Pensacola's public school cost is. It's probably 5000 a year per kid. If there's 30 kids in a class, that's 150000 per class. That teacher does not make $150,000 a year. Something leaks somewhere along the system. Well, not so much funds as it is support. I mean, it's a specialist group that, that they're paying for, a specialized... Uh, sure. Education. Well, my kids at Pensacola Christian, there are 30 kids in a class, just like the public school. 28, 30 kids in a class. And uh, the teachers don't get paid near as much. I, I pay about 1200 a year, 1500 a year per kid. That's about a fourth the cost of our public school system. To me, um, our Constitution does not give our government the right to get involved in education at all. I think education is the parents' responsibility. Now, if the parents want to get together with 50 other parents and form a local school district, fine. But Uncle Sam ought to have nothing to do with the subject, in my opinion. Uncle Sam has gotten involved in numerous things that has, has no constitutional authority to be involved in. It's supposed to be involved in protection. You know, we should have an army and a navy and an air force. And it should be involved in the punishment of evildoers. We should have a judicial system. But in many, like the welfare system, government should have nothing to do with that. That's, that's part of our major problem. The more government gets involved in, which is a whole other subject, you know, but the more taxes they take, and pretty soon we get socialized system where everything goes to them and they just distribute it out, which is what Karl Marx's s system is all about. But back on creation and evolution. The creationist worldview would say the world is not millions of years old. doesn't need to be. Everything can be explained in just a few thousand years. And there are some scientific facts that point to the world not being millions of years old. I'll get into that in a minute. Yes? What do creationists feel about the rest of the universe? Oh, uh, the rest of the universe? Oh, we think it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> Did God create the rest of the universe? Oh, absolutely. I believe God created everything. Pretty much as is. There have been some stars fall apart. We've seen some novas and supernovas, but nobody's ever seen one form. We've seen meteors fall apart. Nobody's ever seen one form. What we see is what would be predicted by the creation model decay, the second law of thermodynamics. Things are winding down. It started with an initial amount, an enormous amount of energy and order and design. It was perfectly formed like a car coming off the assembly line. And since then, it's been steady decline. So what explains the reason that it's not lasting? What, they built it with planned obsolescence or what? I don't think it was built with planned obsolescence. I think it was, it was built to be the perfect place for man. And then man was given the freedom of choice. You can choose to serve God and obey Him or not. 
If you choose to disobey, there are consequences. If you choose not to change oil in your car for 40,000 miles, there are going to be some consequences. How can you blame mankind for causing the change? Well, yeah, as far as all of the nature, see, all of this, it's the creationist worldview would be that the whole universe was created by God, and then man was only put on this earth. I can't prove there's anybody anywhere else. I don't think there is. I can't prove there is or isn't, but that's a outside of the realm of science. But because of man's sin, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, is part of the curse on this earth, and everything is winding down, falling apart. Your house gets dirty, not clean automatically. Your car falls apart, doesn't run better automatically. Everything takes work, and nearly everybody in the world is involved in fighting against the second law of thermodynamics. That's why we have carpenters to build new houses, because the old ones are falling apart. That's why we have repairmen. That's why we have mechanics, you know. Just everybody's got a job because of the second law of thermodynamics. So even if there is a God who has created this perfect system originally, but then gives man or people free will to choose to do otherwise, why would you even choose to be on the side of a God who does sort of, sort of things like that, you know? Who gives you free will and then says, well, if you don't worship me, then you're screwed. Sorry. We're really getting off the subject here. I mean, I'm sorry. Okay. We're really getting off the subject. Yeah, that would be a little different. Um, was there a creator at all? Might be. This might be a bigger view of there had to be a creator of some kind. Now, who is, who was he, and what's he like? What are his attributes? What's his personality like? That's kind of a different subject, but is there a creator? You know, and then if there's a creator, was it Buddha or Allah or Jehovah or, you know, that's, this is where theologians differ by the thousands, you know. And the only way to know for sure who's right is to ask me, of course. Uh, <laughs> I've been involved in, you know, a lot of things as far as energy conservation. I've built numerous houses, and I have tried, you know, with all the different energy conservation laws, but, uh, uh, as well as uh, thermal, I mean, uh, wind generators and that type. I'm very interested in that type of stuff. Okay, I'd love sure. to, love to see the results. Give you, that well, you did love it. It's a great yeah, little Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> I have a question going back to the dinosaurs. Um, okay. Where do you think that the dinosaurs that survived past the flood were just survivors that uh, did not go, or were there dinosaurs that were, uh, I mean, small ones, of course, that were on the ark, or were they all just survivors in the water, like plesiosaur or the brontosaurus or so? Uh, okay. Were there dinosaurs on the on the ark? I would say there had to be dinosaurs on the ark those that needed to be. The Bible is very plain. Noah brought air-breathing, land-dwelling animals. He did not need to bring fish on the ark or whales. We have classified whale as a mammal. Well, that, our classification system dates back a couple hundred years. The Bible classification system may be different, where if it lives in the water, it's a fish, be it whale, dolphin, you know, or barracuda. So we cannot take today's classification system and, and fault the Bible, because a whale may have been considered a fish in biblical terminology, which was long before Carolus Linnaeus came along. But the air-breathing, land-dwelling dinosaurs, we assume Brachiosaurus would have been land-dwelling, though some say, no, they lived in water because they were too heavy to support their weight. I don't know. But Noah, being 600 years old when this boat was built, would have been smart enough to figure out to bring two babies on the ark. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. All right? The reason for bringing babies would be numerous. For one thing, there's only about 40 different kinds of dinosaurs. There are 800 different varieties in the textbooks, you know. There's a Brachiosaur, the Apatosaur, the Cetosaur. Uh, but if you look at a Cetosaurus and an Apatosaurus, you're going to say, that's the same kind of dinosaur. It's like there are 250 varieties of dogs, but Noah only had to have two of the dog kind on the ark. There may be 800 names of dinosaurs out there for these kids to try to learn, but there's only 30 or 40 basic kinds. And if you limit it to babies, no problem, or young ones. After this flood, the climate was different. The water-dwelling dinosaurs, of course, many of those would have been destroyed in ca catastrophic conditions. Fish get killed in the water. You know, an earthquake underwater can kill fish in the water. Thermal shock or uh, uh, just the shock of the uh, tectonic plates moving. But some would survive. You know, because there's a catastrophe, in a worldwide catastrophe, doesn't mean it's simultaneously ca catastrophic. There may be, you know, earthquake here, and six months later, earthquake here. You know, tranquil seas would be someplace. We would have uh, tranquility in the midst of the chaos. Uh, okay, so Noah happened to be in those spots <clears throat> with his ark floating.